before our prayer we will sing 679 679 they'll know we are Christians <clears throat> 679 We are looking at 1 Corinthians 13. We've been, for several weeks here, here a number of weeks, we've been looking at love. Um, I don't know that we'll spend as much time on each one of the fruit of the Spirit, um, but um, we, we, we will spend, we've spent quite a bit of time on love because it's important to understand because the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And if we want to keep those two greatest commandments, we need to understand what love is and what love is not, and really the supremacy of it as well. And so we've been looking at 1 Corinthians 13. When we finish this lesson, when we finish the lessons on love, we'll move on to joy. And at that point, I should, I'll have another handout for you. Um, you know, I don't have one tonight, but if we finish this, I'll have one for you by Sunday, and we won't have a class next Wednesday night. We'll have the devotional, and then we can pick up after Thanksgiving on that. Um, any comments as we get started? Um, you know, you talk about love, and we talk, we're talking about doing for others and agape love. Um, it always amazes me when, when, if we try to do something for someone, they try to do, do back. I mean, I, I mentioned before that we've taken food to people, and they'll have something like, uh, there's been a couple that, well, they had a cake that they baked for us, you know, or here's you something to take back, and, and or they, they send a dish back full of something. I'm like, that's not the way it works, you know. We are... You need to be a, just, just receive it and be happy. And we'll, they said, we are happy and we want to do for you as well. And, and that's, that's appreciation. That's love. And, and, I, and I appreciate, now I'm not saying we ever bring food to your house, you owe us a meal. Don't, don't take it away. Uh, but it, it's nice to see people that care for one another, that love one another, that pray for one another. And, um, you know, you try to go sometimes and encourage people, and they're an encouragement to you. Um, I, I enjoy going to, we go to country cottages on um, every Wednesday, myself and Ava and Emma go, and um, 
some others go sometimes, but we go to country cottages and have a devotional on Wednesdays and, and try to be an encouragement to them. But it's turned around, I mean, because girls will make stuff to give to the, the people there. Well, they turn around and say, hey, we want you to come to my room. And they'll give the girls something and try to encourage them. Uh, they'll, you know, you'll say, we're praying for you, but they turn around and say, we're praying for you. And, and you know, it's just nice to see that, to, to, um, to see that love that's reciprocated um, as well. And we were able to see, uh, we went at, we left after that, went to, um, what's it, Wesley Gardens and saw Sister Crow and um, Lynn Boyd as well. And it's kind of funny, we walked in, had some birthday cards, the girls had birthday cards to give to Sister Crow, walked in, and it was about lunchtime, so we looked in the cafeteria, they go, no, she's over here. And we got, okay, how, does she, how do they know who I am and who I'm going to see? And so we walked in there, and it turned out it wasn't Sister Crow, it was somebody having a 103rd birthday. And she looked probably like she was about 72, 73 years old, this lady did. I mean, I was like, wow. You know, I, you know, I don't expect to be alive at 103, and she looks like she's not that much older than I am. And, um, but Sister Crow was in there singing happy birthday to them, too. To, so we got to see her and Lynn. But I just was amazed. I said, you, you're sure that woman's 103? And she was. But, um, you know, it's an, it's an encouragement to see people encouraging one another as well. But love, we, we work together. We love others as we love ourselves. We, we reach out to them. And, and that's a part of it. We, we suffer long. We're kind. We do not envy. We don't parade ourselves. It's not puffed up. We don't behave rudely. Uh, um, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. That thinks no evil, um, I have a little footnote in mind that says more literally, keeps no accounts of evil. We mentioned last week, holding a grudge, you know, keeping an account of it. Um, you see sometimes people get in fights and they rehash every little thing that someone's done wrong. I saw a cartoon about Methuselah and his wife and it says, Here's, his wife was bringing up something that happened 352 years ago, you know. Uh, so at least we don't have that, that long. And that can go both ways there, by the way. I'm not just picking on women. It can be that way for the wife, too. So think about it that way. It could be a lot longer of keeping, keeping account. But um, anyway, we don't try to keep account of that, hold those grudges. We need to be forgiving. And, you know, God forgives, and he wipes the slate clean. We need to do the same thing as well. Any comments up to this point? Verse 6. Does not rejoice in iniquity. What does it mean to rejoice in iniquity? Okay. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness? Okay. What, what does that mean? How, how can a person rejoice, rejoice in wickedness or unrighteousness? Just enjoy doing the things that are wrong. <laughs> That's a part of it. Do what? Yeah, it contrasts it with re that you don't rejoice in iniquity, but you rejoice in truth. So it's the opposite of the truth. What were you going to say, Mark? Okay. That's kind of the way... Now, I agree with the other things that are there. I mean, if we, really, if we really love God like we should and love the truth, love righteousness, we're not, gonna, we're not going to want to enjoy doing evil or doing wrong. And we shouldn't, of course, we shouldn't do it even if we don't enjoy it. <laughs> but um, as Mark said, we shouldn't rejoice when bad things happen to others. Um, you know, I, I was watching... No, I'm talking about... Well, it depends on if you, I'm talking about the thing that says iniquity. Um, you know, it, it depends, I guess it depends on how you, unrighteousness is, is sinfulness, even that which is not right. If you rejoice in unrighteousness, if you rejoice that your next door neighbor went to the casino and gambled all night and came home with $10,000, would you holler your feet? They were sinning when he was in the casino gambling. How much is he sharing with me? No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking. No, I'm joking. If, uh, that, that would be, that's what I was going to say. That, that's, what, that's what I was going to make the point. That would be rejoicing in iniquity. And by the way, I've not had anyone win at, at the casino or anywhere else and share money with me, and I haven't asked them to. I was just making a point there. Um, when you rejoice in 
Ooh, wow, that's great. We shouldn't rejoice when someone ill-gotten gain or when someone's um, in, a, in sin. I do think, you know, we look at this, um, the, the thing about going before with a thanks no evil, maybe that could go in there as well. But, you know, it's easy to rejoice when bad things happen to even bad people. Um, who is, um, you know, that soccer player, the, the woman soccer player that's been so outspoken on everything? I mean, you know, uh, so outspoken. I mean, she, she, she um, was playing the last game of her career. I mean, she's been one of these that, you know, won't take a knee. You know, she took, takes a knee for the flag, and she's anti-religious values, uh, you know, pro-homosexuality and everything else, as you can imagine. But um, on her last game, within just a few seconds of being out there, she tore her Achilles tendon and will never play another soccer match. And she said, that just proves there is no God. And, and I think, you know, she, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I mean, she could think, but at the same time, the temptations there, boy, ha, ha you know, and, and laugh at her. But it, it's, it's sad. You, you, you just would pray that that would humble her and make her realize, you know, there's something more important than doing what she was doing. It's, it's a sad situation. Yes, that's <laughs> Right, and it's the results of unrighteousness. And again, it, it don't have to be somebody doing that evil, but I mean, it's like when you talk about the thinks no evil um, as well, or some of the other things we've looked at, if, if we're jealous of someone, and they, they all of a sudden stumble, you know, stumble and fall, or they come on misfortune of some kind, it's easy to look at and say, ha ha, you know, you're happy that they, that they fail in whatever way. We, we shouldn't be that way. We treat others the way we want to be treated. We, we show respect. We don't, res, we, don't in, we don't rejoice in sinfulness or evil. We want everyone to be able to, you know, God's not wanting any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That should be our attitude. We don't want people to perish. We want them to come to repentance. But we don't rejoice in iniquity. We don't rejoice in that which is sinful. Um, wish, wishing God speed. You know, I, I have been around people that, are teaching, believing and teaching blatant false doctrine. And, and they'll pretty much wish me Godspeed and I have to be careful how I respond to that because, you know, do, do I really want them to be successful in teaching false doctrine, you know? Uh, and I talk, you know, just, I know I'm not talking about just on matters of opinion, I'm talking about just straight up false doctrine. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that they won't, in many cases they want to do what's right, but I want them to come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, we rejoice in truth. What is truth? God's word. Um, our society has blurred that and basically says truth is relative. I mean, you know, you may have your truth, I may have my truth, or, you know, I guess we bow to political correctness, um, to, um, I think, in, anything and everything goes. Uh, you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you're, society is supposed to accept anything, but they sure don't accept the truth and sure don't, don't accept Christian values and principles. And, and we should rejoice in the truth. The world calls light, darkness, darkness, light, good, evil, evil, good. And um, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends are of the ways of death. But we rejoice in the truth. Can a person is supposed to be a Christian, can we as Christians, can we um, get to a, in some situations, not really rejoice in the truth? And if so, what would be an example? How can we not rejoice in truth? What would cause some people not to rejoice in truth? You know, why would a person not rejoice in truth that's supposed to be a Christian? Okay. <laughs> Ignorant of the scripture? And I, I may not be asking the question... Right. Like truth, you don't like Christ. I may not be asking it the way I want, but sometimes people, you know, a Christian can do something because they know they have to, because it, it says it right here, thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do that. And, well, 
I, I sure don't like it, but I have to. You know, it, it's kind of like a person that's punching the clock at work. You may not want to get up and go go to work, but you know, I got to punch that that time clock and get there at a certain time. And, and you do it because you want to get a paycheck. And uh, that person may not want to be there, may not like their job, but in the same way, some people look at Christianity a little bit like that. I, I punch my time card and um, I put in my time, and then I can clock out. Or you know, you, I sh you know, I sure don't want to have to treat that person in a good way. I don't want to turn to the other cheek, and and we don't rejoice in it. It becomes more of a necessity. Well, that's that's Billy said. That that's not the way it should be. I mean, it should be a rejoicing in it that we're walking in the light, that we're striving to be more Christ-like. That God has loved us enough. He's provided us the light we need. He's provided us his word. And so we should be rejoice, happy that God has told us, hey, you'll get in trouble with this. Hey, this is the right way to do it. Um, do we rejoice in the truth and doing the right thing? You know, people can be ashamed of it. People can be sad about it. But we should rejoice in the truth. Thoughts on that? Like I said, maybe I don't always word my questions in a good way, but... Um, What do you think? I mean, does it always come back around on them in this life? You know why everybody's laughing, don't you? They feel they feel the same. They feel the same way. And then you see the repercussions of what they're. Right, um, I, to me, where it, you know, to me, it can go to a point of where you can say those people don't deserve forgiveness, they don't deserve salvation, and you, you just say that's just, you know, if, if one of them were to become a Christian and, and seek, you know, seek forgiveness, become a Christian, we should rejoice that they re, that they if they truly repent, truly obey, we should rejoice in that and not say, boy, you are a terrorist. Now, they may have to suffer consequences here, but we should rejoice that they get to go to heaven. Just because a person becomes a Christian doesn't mean they may not have to go to prison for something they did. You know. Right. Right, I mean, and that's God ordained, God given, but um, yeah, uh, but and that's something that's you know hard for people to comprehend. But God knows best on that. Um, but you know, you look at that situation. Talk about going there, sl sl um, slay them all. God had told um, um, Abraham that the lamb was going to be his descendants. But he says it's gonna be over, you know it's gonna be over 400 years. You got time of slavery in here, but then you will eventually go in. But because what well, how's it put it? The, the cup of the Amorites is not yet full. I think that's the way it put. I can't remember the exact wording, but basically it's like their cup is filling up with God's wrath. I mean they're they're doing evil, and God says I'm gonna put up with it to a certain point. But when it reaches this point, it's time for them to be punished and taken off the land. So God was even just there. He didn't take um, he didn't take people off that weren't wicked. Now those innocents that were taken out, um, you know, the very little baby, child, you know, child or whatever, it's, it's terrible thought of that. But at the same time, what would happen to those little ones? They would not be lost, you know. But I mean, I, you know, again, it's hard. God sorts all that out and understands it more than we do. Um, and I'm thankful I don't have to sort all that, that out. But um, war is not a pretty thing, by the way. It's not a pretty sight. Kill people, yep, break things and kill people. And that's a that's a bad thought. And I, um, you know, I. I, I think about my friends came back from Vietnam. Yeah. They shot you. They had bombs strapped on them. It's it's a tough. They have to live with. Right. It, it, you know that's a it's a tough thing. You know we sometimes I, I think everyone here appreciates our military and appreciates those men who have given and made ultimate sacrifices or are hurt. You know. Um, 
we had a living example of that with Everett here um, for a long, for many years, and appreciated him. But um, you know, it's it's hard. Like you're talking, going back to the original quest thing with the with the terrorist. Um, it, it, I guess we can rejoice in the sense that evil is being taken down. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we don't want to say, oh, I, I hope they're successful on their next bombing. We're thankful to see the evil being brought down. And, uh, but at the same time, if there's someone in the midst of all of that that seeks God's will, obeys the gospel, we rejoice with them. Now, they may, like I say, may have to go to stand before some trial and may lose their life, but they can save their soul. Uh, sound like I'm going around in circles, but other thoughts on that? I mean, you know, you, yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, I appreciate. It. No, no, really, it's something to think about because, you know, you look at, you look at some of these nations, and I'm not talking about in this situation, but I can remember, you know, with, you look at 9/11, and after that, we were saying, just just blow that whole country off the map. We, we could have wiped out a whole country, you know, and then you look at that situation as well. How, you know, there were actually some Christians in some of those countries too. You know, what do you, what about those? And and it gets into all sorts of thought. You know, when you put a face on some on something, you have to think about. You know, we can hate a person simply because of their race. We can hate a person simply because of their social standing. Or, or but we need to look beyond that as well. But we don't rejoice in iniquity. We don't rejoice in evil doing. We understand that evil has to be punished, and 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 we re, we rejoice when. Law is upheld when morals are upheld. We rejoice not because someone was evil, but because their evil was stopped, and hopefully their punishment um, will um, sway others from doing it. The problem we have in our country is when when you when you face the death penalty. I mean, that's one thing that I understand the appeal process, and that's wonderful. But how long do people have to appeal? Many times, 20, 30 years, and. What does that tell the criminal? I can, I can go through the legal process and I can keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, and, and I may, you know, the law may change in the meantime. But uh, the Bible even talks about swift punishment. You know that, I mean, yeah, you go through the justice system and you're heard, but ultimately when it when you're found guilty in a, in, you know, in a in a right and fair trial and you're found guilty and you know that you're the one that's done that murder, to eventually have your life taken. That will be an example to others that want to do that um, as well. But um, again, those are all different subjects, but we shouldn't rejoice in iniquity. We should rejoice in the truth. There's not just a truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is truth. Right is right. Paul said in season, out of season, you know, as far as preaching and teaching. Love bears all things. What kind of things do we bear? What does it mean to bear all things? What's another scripture say about? Okay, I was gonna say. What's another scripture say? Bear one another's burdens. And, you know, we, we we need help at times, don't we? A shoulder to lean on, someone to lift us up. It might be physical help, spiritual help, emotional help. I mean, we need to bear with people and help them. Of course, we're supposed to bear our own load as well. We can't put responsibility on everyone else. We have to bear up ourselves. But. Um, Bears all things. So it's helping others, help bearing them up. What else is involved in bearing all things? And what other way do we bear all things? Patience. Do, do we have to put up with a lot sometimes? You, somebody might say, well, I have to put up a lot with a lot from you. you know? uh, hopefully we're not the people, we're not people that people have to just put up with. But at times you do have to put up with certain things. You have to bite your tongue, you know. Or you may have to um, turn the other cheek. Uh, because, but we, again, we're not, we've stressed this many times, we're not just trying to win an argument, we're trying to win souls. And um, so we, we, we put up with certain things. I mean, it's one thing if someone's striking out of the truth, but sometimes rather than defend the truth, we're trying to defend our ego, our pride, and there's a difference there. I mean, we should be humble, and we may get our feelings hurt at times. We may... Uh, have our pride shaken a little bit, but um, we still stand for the truth and we bear. We bear with it. Other thoughts? Here's an interesting one. Believes all things. Does anyone have a different version there on verse 7? 
bears all things, and it says believes all things. Okay, believeth all things. Okay, about faith. Okay, so. Okay, we know what it doesn't mean. It, like I said, it doesn't mean to believe a lie about Jesus Christ, Billy said. But you said it's a matter of faith, um, having strong faith. So what are the all things we're supposed to believe? We don't talk about belief, we talk about belief, but what does it mean believe all things? What are the all things we're supposed to believe? The gospel. Okay, this book right here. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And um, what was that? Somebody said from cover to cover and think the cover too. I don't know. It depends on what somebody prints on the cover. But uh, all mine says is Holy Bible, so that's okay. But um, other thought. Okay. Looking for the best in each one. And I do think that plays into it. I mean, ultimately, we believe all things according to God's word. But have you ever just automatically assumed someone's lying to you? With the, even if you don't know, you know, there's some people you may know the situation, may know what happened, and know right out. You know, it, it's like if you see one, if you see it, not one of my children, or grand, not one of my grandchildren or anything, but you, you see a young child that, that may be in somebody's household, anyway. Boy, I'm putting a lot of disclaimers on that. But you see a child doing, you see them doing something they're not supposed to do, and they don't know that you saw them and you confront them, and they're looking all in and say, I didn't do it. And they start maybe blaming it on one of the siblings. You don't believe that because you saw with your own eyes, and, and you try to get them to, you, you try to work them around so they'll actually confess to it without you saying, I saw you. Um, you know, so that doesn't mean we believe that even when they're being dishonest to us. We don't do that. But, do we automatically assume the worst? You know, I, I've been in situations where uh, dealing with somebody that I, I was pretty sure they had, you know, I, I, I was trying to believe the best in them, believe that they, they were not involved in something. Had somebody else tell me, well, you know where there's smoke, there's fire. So they have to be guilty. I mean, that where there's smoke, there's fire. And I said, not necessarily. I said, not in every case. And um, I said, you know. In the Biden house, okay. <laughs> well, I said not in every case. I didn't say not. <laughs> so I'm not speaking on the Biden. So, uh, but um, and we laugh about that, but it's it's the same. You know, we look at this. No, when you look at the, when you look at our politics in our country, it's it's not funny. It's a sad situation, and when you think it can't get any worse, it does. Wait till tomorrow. Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> it may, may not be tomorrow. Maybe later tonight. Um, I, I like it. It does, and and. Um, we just pray that the Lord will let us leave, live a quiet and peaceable life. But are we, are we looking for the best in people? And again, not with blinders on, but, you know, I always like what Reagan used to say with trust but verify. You know, I mean, I mean you know, if it's proven wrong, so be it. But in the meantime, um, sometimes people need the benefit of the doubt, you know, and, and we, need, we need to be there because, you know, um, We'd want people to do that for us as well. Right. It would definitely include that. Uh, you know, you look at situation. It can be a family situation, a spiritual or a physical family situation, and you know someone, and maybe you've been at odds with them, and so anytime anything is said, anytime anything's done, you assume it from the worst intentions or with the worst. You know, you know we can assume some things, and um, and at times, you know, and I, I've seen in some situations where I know both sides that are dealing with it, and. Um, you, you know that both sides are mis, misinterpreting things. And, and you know, they're assuming the worst rather than believing the best. And, um, you know, and again, that does include church. That would include families. 
Other thoughts? Okay. Um, in what way would you put that in here? Okay. Okay, I got you now. Okay, I, I see which way. You, okay, I got you. Okay. And also, as we look at God, do we really believe God in all things? I mean, we can make exceptions like, oh, God, you, know, you don't know, this is a special situation here. I know what your word says, but I'm in special circumstances. I'm the only one that's ever been through it. You know, we can reason that way in our mind and, th you know, and try to outthink God. We don't really trust him. Maybe some don't enough to become a Christian or to follow his commands that are given to us, but do we tr truly believe him in all things? Uh, so there's a lot of different directions on that. Uh, What's the thing? Yeah, that's what we're trying. Yeah, beating around the bush. What do you think the thing is? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you go. You don't. Um, you don't. You rejoice in the truth. So therefore, you bear all things. You believe all things. You hope all that things. You endure all things. Uh, working towards work, the Yeah, work. Um, working towards that goal, that purpose in mind. Like you, in your institute, you're talking about um, trying to um, to convert someone. What, what interests me is, I'm with you, you know? <laughs> well, okay. well, what interests me on that is, I, and not picking on any one religious group, but years ago, I, I was, I was, I was, well, it was, I, I can't remember, and I don't remember the religious groups for sure. I was in my senior, before my senior year in college, I was a youth minister down in Orlando. I mentioned this story before, I know, but I was in a Bible bookstore, and Two people were talking. One, one worked there, and she, this woman came in. She goes, I had not seen you in a while at church. Where have you been? It was some denominational church. And she goes, oh, I started going to so-and-so Pentecostal church. And, well, why would you go in there? She said, because in our other church, in the church you go to, they don't do, they, God doesn't do miracles there, but he does miracles in the Pentecostal. And I thought, okay. And they, they, she goes, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And I thought, okay, that's just kind of interesting. So God picks this group, and I do miracles over here, but I won't do miracles over there. It's, it's, either, it's either all or none, I think. I mean, I just don't. I see how you can get that, but I guess uh, it's just a totally different mind frame that's there. But um, but we we are trying to reach out to others. We're trying to show Christ to them. We're willing to endure all things. And again, as um, Brother Perry said, there's bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. What are things? I mean, and, and maybe it's purposeful just to say things. So you can look at it from a number of directions. But he said, understand that love's not just something that you put on for a moment. It is from our heart. It shows in our lives. And then he says, love never fails. Love never fails. Do you, is, is love always successful? Oh, God is. He's love. Okay, so God, God is love and God doesn't fail. True love doesn't fail. I mean, 
like you said a minute ago, if you're trying to convert someone and you exhaust every avenue you know and do everything you can, you've done what you could because you love them. Was it successful in converting them? No. But, were, but did love fail? Not as far as you're concerned. You love them, and hopefully they'll become more receptive later, you know, um, or whatever it may be. But love does not fail. God's love doesn't fail for us. We may fail God, but his love for us doesn't fail. And if we choose love, it's superior to speaking in tongues. It's superior than prophecy. It's superior than all these other things. And that's what he says in the next part of the verse. Love doesn't fail. It never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And I think he's talking about um, miraculous knowledge. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. He says, all over who has the best spiritual gift, this, that, or the other, and what's more important, and I'm better than you, and, and who wants to, have, to take over most of the service with doing what they can do. And he says, you're hanging on to things that won't last forever. I mean, you're not going to always... It's, during the time of this world, you're not going to always be able to prophesy or speak in tongues or um, have miraculous knowledge. He said, they're there for a purpose. What was, what was the purpose of those miracles? To advance Christ's church. To do what? Advance okay, to advance Christ. To establish, to advance Christ's church. And it confirms the word. You know, um, Jesus could prove who he was by the miracles that he did. I mean, he, that the claims he was making was true by the miracles he performed. The apostles and, could, and the ones that received the laying on the apostles' hands, they could confirm that what they were, was, were saying was right because how could they do the works they're doing if they weren't, I'm telling the truth, and they weren't really from God? It, it confirmed the word, and it helped make people realize that what's being said is the truth and would hopefully cause them to respond to the truth as well. And so it was important. That miraculous knowledge was important. They, didn't, they had the completed Old Testament at that time. Uh, I think Jesus put his seal of approval on it because he quoted from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament at times. I mean, you know, they had that in place. But then in the early days of the church, the, different, the gospel accounts, the, uh, the epistles were being written, the book of Revelation written, I think, I think later in the second, well, the second half later in, in the... Uh, first century, I believe. But in the meantime, they needed to know the truth. And, and people could receive the laying on the apostles' hands, and some of them would have the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy. And that was important for them in that early church to be able to have that as, as much or maybe even more so than being able to heal someone or, or to um, do some of these other things. And so they were important. They served a purpose. But he says, look, you only know in part. Those Old Testament prophets, did they understand everything they prophesied? They didn't, did they? They tried to figure it out. And they, some of it could be obvious. I mean, if God prophesied, you know, if the prophet said, God said, if you'll go in and do what I say, I'll give you this city or I'll give you this country. That's rather obvious, whether, you know, what, what he's saying. But there's some of the things, like you look at Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and some of those that prophesied about coming things. Isaiah had prophesied about a kingdom and about a king, talking about Christ um, and his kingdom, and, and he didn't fully comprehend. Um, you can go, the, the people of the first century could look back at some of Daniel's prophecies and some of Isaiah's prophecies, and they kind of pieced it together and say, wait a minute now, if they, if they wanted to, they could have looked at it and said, this is about the right time. This, and then they could know that Jesus was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, but be a Nazarene. But it's easier after the fact to look back and say, hey, Jesus fit this one, this one, this one, this one. He is the Messiah. They didn't fully comprehend when they were prophesying everything that they were prophesying about. But now we have the word and we can go back and say, okay, Daniel was prophesying about Christ coming, about establishing his kingdom, the church. You can look at Isaiah, the suffering servant is Jesus. Uh, and we can, uh, the, the place where he'd be born is Bethlehem. He'd be born of a virgin. But... The New Testament, they had those people that could perform miracles, and that was wonderful. But isn't it much better to have the completed word? You know, from not only Genesis through um, um, Malachi, but also Matthew through Revelation. 
to have that completed world. We can see it from beginning to end and go through it and read about Christ's birth, about his ministry, about his death, burial, and resurrection. And then we can go through and see the growth, the beginning of the church, the growth of the church, letters written to, to Christians um, to encourage them and to talk against false doctrine and talk for what's right. And then you look at the book of Revelation, that hope that is there as well, um, that's given in that book. Uh, we have the completed word. He said, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is a part will be done away. And I believe what he's saying, look, when the word of God is completed, when we have that complete um, revelation given to us, we won't need those miracles anymore. I can say, hey, that's what Acts 2.38 says, for instance, when it comes to baptism. Um, or we can use other scriptures talking about Christian, the fruit of the Spirit, saying, oh, that's the kind of heart we're supposed to have. Um, and so he says, put it this way, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. And he, you know, he, he's talking to those Corinthians, he's talking to us, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, it's cute to listen to a child talk in a certain way and understand or misunderstand some things, but when you become an adult, hopefully you've grown beyond that and you understand as an adult. And he says, look, you're hanging on to those miracles. They're not going to last forever. There's something far better. We have the completed word of God. And so, and you put those things away. Any thoughts on that part? We are out of time. We'll get the last two verses as we begin on at, and next time, two weeks from tonight. Do what? Sure. Right. Okay. Oh, the books will be settled at the end of time. I mean, you know, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. And I'm ultimately, but now like Billy said earlier, the governments have a place in certain things too. But where's our heart? Where's our focus? We may focus on them, but we need to be focused on our heart and our lives too. That's a good point. We'll take up with more discussion on that. I appreciate all the discussion we've had. Song is number 380. 380, just as I am. You know, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. I'm a, a week from tomorrow. And I hope that we understand that Thanksgiving for the Christian is not once a year, it's every day. That we have so much to be thankful for. It was mentioned in class a moment ago, we were talking about love, but we went every which way. Some, it was mentioned just before we closed class, you know, we need to look at ourselves and our lives and, and make ourselves what we should be. We need to be thankful. For so much. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry sea. Are we thankful? I hope we're thankful. We'll, Sunday morning we'll talk about giving thanks and things that we're supposed to be thankful for and, and um, sing some songs along that line as well. We'll have a devotional next Wednesday night focusing on the same thing. But are you thankful for the Lord? Are you thankful for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ? If you're a Christian, be thankful. Be thankful that your sins have been washed away in the blood of Christ. Walk in the way that He would have you to walk and live your life according to His Word. And give thanks each day for the hope that you have in Christ. If you're not a Christian, be thankful. Be thankful that 
The Lord loves you and He wants you to be saved. And once you come to Him, trusting in Him, believing His Word, giving thanks that He loved you and died for you, once you die to yourself to live for Christ, once you put on your Lord in baptism and have your sins washed away. If you have any need tonight, come just as you are. Come seeking forgiveness and we'll help you in any way that we can. Once you come, together we stand while we sing.